our gospel reading this morning. I don't know that I actually need to read it after Beth's uh, children's sermon. Thank you for that, Beth. But I'll be reading the gospel from Luke, chapter 36. We're we'll reading from verse 36 through verse 50, and a few other things have changed in 10 years. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And a woman in the city who was a sinner, having learned that he was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. Then she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him. And that she is a sinner. Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, he replied, speak. A certain creditor had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debts for both of them. Now, which one will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the greater debt. And Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house, you gave me no water for my feet, but she has bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Hence, she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. And then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. But those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. The word of God for the people of God. God is still speaking. Thanks be to God. Amen. Won't you pray with me, please? Oh, holy God, what a gift it is to come home. And for there to always be a loving home to come home to. We ask there in this time, as we gather around the table of fellowship and worship, as we consider your word, that you would help us to hear exactly what it is that we need to fill us up, heal us, challenge us, and inspire us to go back out into the world and to share that love wastefully with others. So come, Holy Spirit, we pray, so that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts here together might be pleasing in your sight, O God, who is our rock and our redeemer. Amen. <coughs> Laws, rules, grace, Brokenness, forgiveness, love. Do you know anything about any of these? If I had to sum up the lectionary text assigned for this week, I initially thought that the common theme was about bullies, people behaving badly and being confronted. First Kings 21, Naboth won't give King Ahab some land that Ahab wants, so Ahab mopes until his wife, Jezebel, frames Naboth for a crime so he'll be stoned to death and Ahab can get his land. God sends the prophet Elijah to confront Ahab, saying, dude, bad call. 
You're going to be dog meat, literally. 2 Samuel 11 and 12, King David falls into lust with Uriah's wife. So he sends Uriah to the front lines to be killed and then takes Uriah's wife for his own and has a son by her. God sends Nathan to say, dude, not cool. David repents, but the story goes that tragedy still befalls the household as David's son falls ill and dies. Psalm 5, the psalmist cries out, hey God, there's some bad folks down here doing some bad things. And since you don't like bad things, please help a psalmist out here. Luke 7, a Pharisee judges a woman as sinful and unworthy and judges Jesus for allowing the woman to touch him. But Jesus teaches the Pharisee a lesson, literally. I began to wonder, I was looking through these texts, what kind of Facebook likes and loves and angry faces and comments we would see if these stories were actual posts. That's right, go get them, God. You tell them, Jesus. We all become experts on parenting and gorillas and constitutional law in a heartbeat, don't we? But one of the most stunning moments in all of my seminary training at Perkins was when we were introduced to liberation theology and it was pointed out to us young, snot-nosed, earnest defenders of what was good and just in the world, full of righteous indignation, that most often we read ourselves into biblical stories by identifying with the ones who are oppressed and fail to notice the ways in which we are actually similar to the oppressors. Ouch. That piece of humble pie was incredibly hard for us young seminary students to swallow. Self-righteousness usually is. I like being Elijah and Nathan and the psalmist and the woman pouring back out on Jesus the grace that she knew she had received. I don't want to be Ahab or Jezebel or David on any of his many bad days or the Pharisee and I try hard not to be like them because I detest the evil that I see being done in the world and I can't stand the brokenness and suffering and I abhor the systems of oppression that allow a black man to get 15 to 25 years in prison while a white swimmer gets around three months in county jail and I still want to know what happened to Sandra Bland and I grow tired of hate speech passing as presidential and discrimination hiding behind the banner of religious liberty. But you know, this is where I get into trouble because I detest, I can't stand, I abhor, I still want to know, I grow tired. I used neither the words love nor grace, healing nor transformation, restoration, anywhere in that rant. And the rabbi I claim to follow didn't let the Pharisee have it. And the way that I read our gospel lesson today, the lesson teaches that Jesus teaches the Pharisee doesn't involve violence or threat of retribution on any level. I don't hear a tweet-worthy burn of the Pharisee anywhere in this reading. What I hear Jesus saying is, Simon, and don't you get it? It's grace. Her sins are forgiven. It wasn't even her actions of love towards me that saved her. Her faith saved her even before I sat down at the table. Because out of her understanding of her own deep brokenness, out of realizing exactly how much she had been forgiven and touched by grace herself, because she knows what it means to be restored, her love runs deeply, and it can't help but pour out of her. And so which cup of mine runneth over? My fear and my frustration? My sense of helplessness? Or my faith and my love? Do I recoil in anger and disgust at what my brothers and sisters do? 
Or do I allow my tears to touch and anoint those around me with the healing that I remember that I have been given and received? Is my anger or my weary rants, are they fueled by love for all parties involved? Or by my own helplessness that just wants to lash out because I fear I have no other recourse? Do I limit God's creativity and come from an immature place of wanting a simple justice of revenge? Today's epistle, the author writes that we are justified, made just, by faith, not law, not retribution, not paybacks, not punitive justice. This time last year, I shared on Facebook, and it showed up in my memory, so I recently shared it again a few days ago, that Pastor Dan wrote about yet another moment between human beings that spawned outrage last year, an emphasis on the rage. He shared that punitive justice is not what we are called to. Punitive justice makes us content, which does nothing to change the broken system. But the author of Galatians doesn't leave us alone there. He goes straight from preaching to meddling when he says... That if in our efforts to be justified in Christ, we build up again the very things we once tore down, then we are also sinners and transgressors. Which to me means, if in the process of standing up against what we perceive to be evil, and we perpetuate evil ourselves, then we are no better than the evil that we're trying to tear down. If we believe that justification comes through the law, if we come from a place of disdain and desire for retribution, then Christ died for nothing. And whether you are one who believes that Jesus was a Messiah who died for our sins, or whether you believe that he was a teacher who stood up against evil and oppression and said, do your worst. I'm not going to run away. I'm not going to fight back. I'm going to stand here and show you that love wins. In either case, I don't think we want that death to be in vain because we desire now cheap justice. Restorative justice is what we are called to if we want true change, Dan wrote. Restoration means both the oppressed and the oppressor, both in our world and simultaneously inside of us, are healed. A few months ago, I grew weary. I avoided social media for years. I was the one that you hated because I would get on Facebook about every 10 months and say thanks for the birthday wishes six months ago. I was that friend. Um, But when I uh, began doing business, it became uh, necessary for me to engage in various forms of online media multiple times a day with numerous groups and thousands of people. And it can be enlightening. It can be addictive, and I mean, it can be fun. Let's be honest, you haven't lived until you've watched the Star Wars parody, Hello from the Dark Side, set to Adele's song, Hello, or Cats Failing at Being Cats, one of my favorites. Sorry, Diane, I love cats, but still, it's hysterical. Um, Or the woman cracking up the entire world with a Chewbacca mask. And you really haven't lived until you have seen a pastor returning from sabbatical to a handbell choir playing the Darth Vader theme as he processes down the aisle in worship. But it can also get incredibly overwhelming with so much pain and brokenness scrolling down our news feeds in record time so fast that we don't have space to process, run tragedy or grief or outrage before another comes along, much less to do anything constructive about it. And that's where I believe media in general can be truly dangerous for us. Earlier this spring, I had someone angrily confront me about why I wasn't taking a public stand on a certain issue, against a certain issue. Around that same time, I heard friends over dinner and cocktails and game nights increasingly ranting about some news stories. One of them got so upset about a child abuse case in our area that she finally ended her thoughts in frustration that the parents should just be lined up against a wall and shot after having everything done to them that they had done to the children. 
I finally spoke up then and responded that, much as Dan did, about my belief in our need for restorative rather than punitive justice, if any of us have any hope of something better, including those children who had been abused and the adults who had abused them, who in all statistical probability had been violently abused themselves when they were kids. Thankfully, my friend still loves me and still breaks bread with me. But the stance that I try to take, the stance I believe Jesus calls us to, and where I believe Galatians 2 and even Luke 7 holds our heart to the light, is not always a popular position. And so I felt the need at that time, back in March, to write and post the following. I don't watch the news or take a paper or follow most news stories. It's not that I don't want to engage or be a good citizen or good insert noun here. It's that I learned a long time ago that if I have energy available to actually do something constructive about whatever gets my blood boiling and passion or righteous, righteous indignation, that's great. But if I don't have space to do something to make a positive difference, I'll simply wind up feeling frustrated and helpless and become just one more negative, self-righteous voice contributing to the muck and mire. I'll do nothing more than engage in, pardon the term, but bitching about a situation I'm doing nothing to help, about other people whom I can quick, be quick to blame and vilify, about a problem I'm only contributing to rather than actually helping to solve, and that's not good for me or how I claim I want to show up in the world. My personal faith tells me I'm to pray for those who consider themselves my enemies or whom I misguidedly label as such because I focus on only one aspect of who they are as another human being on the planet. It tells me I can't bless God out of one side of my mouth while cursing my brother out of the other. It tells me that violence takes many forms and that in the course of speaking out against what I believe to be an injustice, I can become equally unjust and commit verbal violence myself if I carelessly speak about another human being in a denigrating way. I can speak out and offer complaint about actions that are not acceptable to me, but I go too far if I speak of others with contempt and hate. Of course I get hurt. Of course I feel angry. Of course I sometimes, okay, often go too far when I feel wronged. I screw all of this up plenty. But it's still my goal. Of course there are things about which I feel called to take action or personally set boundaries. And I do have causes I work to support and things I believe are wrong that I work to make right. My work to prevent religious abuse and advocate for better end-of-life care for, and grief support for all people is where most of my energy is spent these days. That's what I have time and energy and capacity to do something about. I do not advocate silence or apathy, but for sanity's sake, I must be careful that I not simply join the bloodthirsty crowd in the modern-day arena, jeering and yelling and looking for a cathartic release from my feelings of powerlessness. It's better for me to light a single candle rather than to curse the darkness, lest the spit frothing from my venomous words snuff that candle out. I don't mean to preach at others here. I have no one particular in mind, but I was asked why I don't take a stand more in what I write and blog and post, and I responded that I do. I take a stand for peace and equality and goodness and education and things that connect and build and unite. I'd rather stand for compassion than rant against hate. That's what I have to contribute. And God grant that I may do so even more and live out what I claim to believe more often as well. The response that I got to that was pretty overwhelming and humbling, to say the least, as others who felt the same way chimed in and said this. This is what I've been wanting to say but haven't been able to find the words for. And so I felt just as validated as they did in response. But it also led to some deep and hard and touching conversations about the far harder question of how the heck do you really actually pull that off? I believe our answer lies with the lesson we heard from Jesus today. Brene Brown, University of Houston School of Social Work researcher and professor of TED Talk and Oprah fame, talks about her research in shame and vulnerability. And she says, we cannot have judgment of others if we don't already have judgment toward ourselves. Shame begets shame, and it doesn't come from a vacuum. If we want to become less critical and shaming of others, we first have to heal our own internal shame. 
And Jesus says, therefore, I tell you her sins, which for many have been forgiven. Hence, she has shown great love. Can we allow God's healing love to call us to a place past punishment, past rants? Can we allow the understanding of our own capacity for oppression to break us open, not just to the pain of the world, but to the pain of other oppressors? Can we be angry and sin not? Can we show love to a world that is desperate to know that another way is possible. Some of you may know the writings of Araya Mountain Dreamer. Of, um, she wrote The Invitation and The Dance and several other beautiful pieces. She shared this a couple of years ago, shared an excerpt and then made some comments about a piece from her book, The Dance. She wrote from The Dance, when I was 22, I was raped. When I think of the man who raped me when I am meditating, and I do now, even years later, when I've heard the story of another woman who's been raped, I see this man and myself held by the heart of that which is larger than and yet a part of myself. I breathe and I let the larger heart that has always held me that is embodied in my essence, hold my pain and my anger. And when I do this, I catch a glimpse of the suffering, the anguish there must be inside the human being who violates another. Knowing this, I cannot help but remember that this man was once, like my own sons, some woman's child with hopes and fears. And it is not as impossible as I once thought it would be to pray and cry, not just for myself, but also for him. And after sharing that excerpt from the dance, she closes with, in no way does this excuse rape or other forms of violence. But it is to say that we are in trouble when violence escalates, all of us, even the perpetrators, I did not ask for nor cause the rape that happened to me, not on any material or spiritual level, but I did choose, eventually and with help, to let the pain of what had happened split me open, to let that which was larger than myself hold me and the man who raped me. I do not want to see him again, have no need or desire to do so, but after all these years, it is not hard to pray for him. Genuine forgiveness is not a should, she says, when we allow our wounds to be tended and to heal. Forgiveness arises. It's not a mental decision. It's an innate capacity of the human heart, and it is one of the best things about us that we can forgive and be free. By the grace of God and the transformational and healing example of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, may it be so. Amen.